Hey, in this week's video, I'll show you how I throw and trim my small half pound balls. Not only are these very simple to throw, but they're also one of the pieces that I can throw the quickest, which makes them quite useful. As if I have an hour or so of time to kill, these are a good way to fill it. Each is thrown from half a pound of really soft clay. As they're so small and there's barely any height in them whatsoever, I can get away using incredibly soft clay, the likes of which I'd only use otherwise for throwing plates. As per usual, I start off by wedging the clay thoroughly. Spiral wedging like this removes all the air pockets and also makes the entire lump of clay totally homogenous. And the better your clay is wedged, the easier time you'll have later once you're actually throwing. Whenever I weigh out clay for pots which I'm going to be throwing many multiples of, I don't worry too much if the weight is, you know, 10 or 5 grams out, as long as it's more or less there, I don't mind. The final step of the wedging procedure is just to knock these little balls into shape. And I do that two at a time, rolling them and then slamming my hands down on them. This brings together all the pieces of clay and also removes any last bits of air that might be trapped inside the lump. Of course, if you were throwing off the hump of clay, then all you'd have to do is wedge up one big mass. That's it. Whereupon each pot is thrown atop this large mass of clay, one after another after another. And even though this was a technique I was taught in Japan when I apprenticed with Ken Matsuzaki for six months and threw countless hundreds and hundreds of pieces, I still find myself drawn to throwing one single pot at a time on the wheel head. I feel like I can throw more accurately this way, as the balls of clay are predetermined in weight, and also I have a throwing pointer which never has to be changed, as the mass of clay doesn't slowly decrease in size as I work. Anyhow, let's get throwing. You'll notice at the very beginning when I just threw the ball of clay onto the wheel, there was a thin skim of dry clay that was left over from where the previous pot was sliced off from. I see some potters that remove this skim of clay every single time in between each pot when, in fact, it's really useful as it holds the next ball of clay thrown onto it really firmly in place. That's if it hasn't already been soaked in water, in which case the ball of clay won't stick at all. The actual throwing of these is relatively simple. I pull the clay up a number of times until it's above my pointer, which is what you see poking on the screen from the right hand side. I then gradually ease the walls of the bowl outward until the rim of the bowl hits the rubber of the pointer. All I'm focusing on at this point is the interior form. In some ways it doesn't matter that the outside is perhaps messy, as eventually I'll be trimming the outside, whereas I will not be trimming the interior form whatsoever. Once the height and diameter are correct, it's time to move on to the finishing procedures, the first of which is to remove the water from the inside, then I use an old blunted turning tool to remove the skirt of clay around the base. I do this step first before finishing off the inside, as pushing in the tool can often distort the interior form slightly, which I then correct with a sharp metal kidney, as you can see here. If you want to learn how to throw quickly and proficiently, one of the things you must do is eliminate all faffing around and sort of those extra little steps along the way that end up being unnecessary. It can be hard when you're learning to identify what those are, and I actually recommend filming yourself and watching the footage backwards as you might be able to spot a few of them along the way. Lifting these away is made easier by the fact that I've left the bases of these bowls quite thick, so much so that I can actually dig my fingers in a little bit and not worry about the deformation, as I'll just be trimming this away later anyway. Whenever you're centering smaller lumps of clay, you want to use the palms of your hands and the heel of your hands rather than your actual fingertips, although when it comes to opening up the ball of clay and shaping it, it's mostly fingertip work thereafter. It certainly takes practice throwing on a smaller scale, Thankfully I have quite small hands I think, and I don't feel like they get in the way much. But really it all comes down to practice. I've seen potters with hands the size of spades throw tiny small things. It all just depends on your technique. Admittedly I use quite a lot of water whilst making these. It makes the centering very quick, and as they're thrown so quickly, I don't have to worry about the water degrading the clay's quality, and weakening it for other shapes or more complicated vases and things. I'm definitely more liberal with the amount of water I use. Here I'm pushing in the kidney again using the curved side and transferring that curve into the bowl's soft clay. I don't try and get the surface completely smooth and perfect. I like there being some marks of the maker, be it throwing rings or some tool marks. There being a handmade quality is what makes handmade pots so beautiful. Each pot is different and shows the hands of their own maker. When it comes to lifting these away from the wheel, I position my fingers in such a way that the weight is distributed evenly amongst them and I keep my fingers really locked into position steady as I move the bowl onto the wearboard. Lifting pots away like this is definitely a process that requires practice. Thereafter, I let the bowl sit out overnight, in this weather at least. As it's autumn now, and the weather's a lot colder, everything's taking longer to dry. 
early the following morning I'll come in and I'll flip the bowls over onto their rims. That way the bases have ample time to dry out before I trim them. With trimming it's all about waiting until your clay is at just the right consistency before you work. If they're either too firm or too soft, you'll only make your life more difficult. In this case I ended up covering them for another day as I was previously firing the kiln and they were perfect. The feet of these are about 4.5 centimeters across. I set my pair of calipers to that width. This pair of calipers is incredibly tight, which is what you want if it's a tool you're picking up and putting down a lot during the turning session, as you don't want this measurement changing all the time. Once I'm ready to go, I simply tap center the piece into place, which is a technique many of you have been asking me to make a film about, so I'll try and do that in the next couple of weeks. I then use three soft bits of clay, which I push down against the wheel head to hold the pot in place. Then I take my measured calipers and a sharp potter's needle and score in my measurement across the base. This line marks my outer diameter of the foot ring. I don't bother scoring an interior diameter line as really this is something I can just judge with my eye when I'm actually turning it. Thereafter it's just a matter of removing all the excess clay, thinning out the walls and forming the foot. One thing you'll notice is that my two hands are always touching whenever I work. This helps to stabilise my movements. I thought this was an interesting view. This is what I see when I'm working. I have a mirror in front of me that I look in, and it shows me the side view of the pot that I'm trimming. Otherwise, if I didn't have this, I'd always be looking at the pot from above, and the only way to see the side view is by awkwardly leaning backwards. So nowadays I really find this one of my most useful tools. Once the outer form is done, it's time to start removing clay from inside the foot ring. It's quite easy to slip during this process, so I make sure to hold my hands and the tool incredibly tightly and you'll see that my fingers really grasp the turning tool right near the head of the tool. This way I can apply the most pressure and ensure that any wobbles that come along don't affect my trimming. I'll simply trim through the wobble or inconsistency rather than letting those influence my trimming. That's why trimming can be such a mechanical process in some ways compared to throwing. I keep the wheel spinning quickly and I keep my upper body weight pushing down on my arms, steadying them which in turn helps me keep my trimming tool nice and steady too. These final little trimming movements are just to remove the wiring off marks on the base of the foot. And finally, I stamp the foot ring with my tiny little maker's mark that I handmade from porcelain. This does displace the clay a little bit, so I just have to trim a tiny little bit just to make it nice and smooth again. And finally, I just use the tips of my fingers to run over the base, over the sharp edges, removing any sharpnesses there might be. I then carefully lift the piece away, check the inside form to make sure that it hasn't deformed during the trimming process and set it aside. The board that I'm placing these onto is completely wiped clean of any dirt or clay. That way there's nothing that can embed itself into the foot, ruining the pristinely trimmed base. This next clip shows what happens when you trim away too eagerly from inside the foot ring. Ruining pots happens to the best of us, and it happens often too. Any pot who says otherwise is a liar in my books. I'd say I'd probably destroy about two pots out of every hundred. Of course it's still frustrating, I just set the piece aside, let it go bone dry and then recycle it, ready to be used again one day. It's far more annoying when you wreck pots such as teapots or any kind of lidded form which requires a lot more work. A simple bowl like this isn't really the end of the world. One of the things that really sets apart a good trimmer from a bad one is the conviction at which they can work. You need confidence to trim away clay quickly, to really dig your tool in and know the limitations of the vessel underneath. Of course it takes practice but I think generally speaking, many of the potters I see these days online should be trimming with more conviction. So often is it the case that the clay is guiding them rather than you, the potter, should be the one in control. But like I said, I think it comes with practice. My tutors in college always told us to really go for it when trimming, to spin the wheel fast and to really gouge away lots of the material in as few movements as possible. There are too other moments where you need to be more careful and these bowls are a good example of that with their delicate small feet but leading up to that, the lower half of the walls and the supporting clay, those areas should be removed quickly and with real conviction. And that's why it's so important to make sure that the clay's condition is at the right kind of dryness before you start to trim it. If it's too soft, the bowl will deform as you push down with the trimming tool. Also, if it's too soft, the ribbons of clay that come off will stick back to the bowl and you'll constantly have to be stopping the wheel to remove them. And equally, if the bowl is too firm, you'll have just as much trouble trimming it and you can even hurt your wrist as the pressure you need to apply with the trimming tool is so great. Also, instead of the ribbons coming off in lovely long strands, they'll come off in tiny shards and your overall progress will be far slower. That being said, it isn't always the easiest to keep constant watch over your clay 
sometimes overnight pots will dry out more than you think and then you have to work with whatever condition the clay is in anyway. But I'm sure as any potter knows, it really feels good when the clay is in just the right condition. Now all trimmed and finished, these bowls dry out incredibly quickly. From their initial thrown weight of half a pound, they weigh almost half of that once turned. So usually it just takes a day or two before I'm able to put them into the bis kiln. These small bowls make great kiln fillers on the layers in my gas kiln of other larger bowls. And once bisque fired, I'll glaze them with either a white, a pale green, or a dark green crackle glaze, like you'll see in a moment. They're simple little things, and they're pots that I don't have to think too much about when I'm making, which can be a relief after spending a couple of days carefully putting together teapots and jars, or delicate thrown ink dip pens. And here are the finished things. First is the white, which always appears far more speckled with dots of iron from reduction compared to the other two. You can clearly see the area where I wax the foot before they're dipped in glaze. This exposed clay often flashes red from where the soluble salts and the feldspar volatilize during the firing. Next is the pale green, colored by a single percentage of red iron oxide, which under reduction changes the pot from being yellow to a sort of bluey pale green. And finally, the dark green, coloured by just 2% of red iron oxide. This is by far my favourite of the glazes, as the interaction on the sharp edges is so stark. It often changes to a bright red, almost orange colour. Anyhow, that's all for this week. Catch you next time.